God has called us for worship. God has called us for prayer. God has called us to evangelism. God has called us for discipleship. And God has called us for revival. He said to me, this is what the Lord says to Zerubbabel. It is not by force nor by strength, but by my spirit, says the Lord of heaven's army. Somebody scream it out. By my spirit. By my spirit. Once again, by my spirit. By my spirit. And then we, we read uh, the, the, the tagline that we've been reading throughout the entire week. Uh, knowing and cultivating an intimate relationship with the Holy Spirit releases his presence, his comfort, his guidance, his abilities, and his power in our lives, roles, and responsibilities. That is why we are studying this. Okay, when we study who the Holy Spirit is, what happens is his presence, his power, his guidance, his uh, abilities, his, his glory is, is revealed in our lives. Amen? Amen? What did we study last Sunday? The purpose of anointing. Give me this slide and we're going to declare this out together. The purpose of anointing is to beautify us, to give us a fragrance, to give us consecration, to give us intimacy with God, to bring healing from God, to fuel our lives and to help us worship. Can we do it once again? The purpose, the real purpose of God anointing us with His presence, with His Holy Spirit is not for, for us to show it off, but it is for us to beautify us, to beautify our lives, to add a fragrance to our lives, to consecrate us, to help us get involved in an intimate relationship with Jesus and to experience healing. You remember that, right? Soothing comforting over our wounds amen and to give fuel and and also to help us worship amen, amen. today we are going into the second part of uh, anointing we are talking about the path to anointing everybody say the path to anointing yes. now there are many people that say that there is always a price to pay when if you have to get the anointing now, I understand the fact that there are sometimes there are sacrifices to be made, there are, but I would never use it as price because Jesus already paid the price on the cross, okay? There can be no price better, greater, uh, or more important than that price that Jesus already paid for us on the cross, amen? amen? Is there any price that you've paid that compares with what Jesus did for us? You know, have you heard those people who say, oh, I had to leave full-time job, I had to sacrifice, you know, a six-figure salary, and, you know, and that's how I'm serving God. It looks like you're so miserable now, and that was so good. <laughs> and, and you're saying, you know what, Jesus only had to die on the cross, but I had to give six-figure salary away. Dude, get a reality check. That, what Jesus did on the cross, is what is the ultimate price anybody ever could have paid. And he has already done it. And there is no, nothing that you can ever do that compares to the price that Jesus paid for us on the cross. Can I get, a, can I get an amen for that? Yeah. yeah. But, but there is a path that we need to take. And, and today I'm going to give you five pointers, okay? And... Uh, the first thing that you need on your way to anointing, if you want to walk in anointing, is hunger. Everybody say hunger. hunger. Scream it out. Hunger. hunger. See, God will give you the anointing. God will give you his presence, but he will not force it down your throat. You yourself have to be hungry for it. If, if you're not hungry, doesn't matter how much God makes a provision for it, doesn't matter how much God push you into it, you will never be able to experience or receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. And no anointing, and, and it's not even like you experienced anointing of His presence yesterday and today you don't need any more anointing. You know, that is the, that is the ones who, who are satisfied with, you know, 
yesterday's anointing but what Jesus did you know if you read the, the book of uh, the gospels you would see how Jesus would pray every night and he would spend time in prayer and he would he would be hungry to have a relationship have a conversation with God and there are some times when the bible says when Jesus came down from the mountain the power of God was flowing through him wait a minute wasn't it flowing all the time no but there are some times when it is very specifically mentioned that the he came down from the mountain and the power of god was flowing through him and and sick people were getting healed left right and center what happens during those times is that you know you've you've had a fresh unction a fresh anointing of the holy spirit jesus walked in it the apostles walked in it all in you know, all great generals of god who have walked in a, an increased measure of god's presence in their life they knew the key is to be hungry for it is to go after it be desperate for it god will never give you something that you don't want Can I repeat it once again? God will not give you his holy spirit especially his holy spirit if you don't want it. Do you know why? Because holy spirit the father and Jesus they are very protective of the holy spirit. They don't want you to abuse misuse the presence of the holy spirit. They don't want you to quench his spirit. They don't want you to grieve the spirit of God. So unless you ask for it, unless you hunger for it, unless you are desperate for it, he will not give you that. Can I give you an example of hunger in the Bible? Give me the verse, the book of Matt Luke chapter 19 and verse 1 and to read it with me. Jesus entered Jericho and made his way through the town. There was a man there by the name Zacchaeus. He was the chief tax collector in the region and he had become very rich who are we talking about this morning the the the, the chief tax not just a tax collector but the chief the senior most tax collector in Jericho amen and what is his name his name is Zacchaeus and and what do we see here we see that you know he you know he jesus is has come into that city jesus has come into that particular place give me the next verse it says he tried to get a look at jesus but unfortunately what does the bible say what does the bible say he was too short to see over the crowds thankfully uh, there was a a tree what was it called a sycamore fig tree and what did zacchaeus do you know you and i what would we have done we would have gone home and say jesus keeps visiting jericho yeah i mean he is not a new comer to jericho i'm sure in another one week's time he is going to come back this way that time i'm i have enough money i think i can buy a front row ticket to see jesus next time you know it's not a big deal if i don't get an entry into church this morning the uh, two no chairs in church this morning it does, it doesn't matter next sunday oh live fb live the service is live on fb it doesn't matter you know and sometimes we take a step back and and that is a proof of your lack of hunger everybody say this with me hunger you know when you are not desperate for more you know how was you, how were you when you just got saved do you guys remember when you just got saved when you just started following jesus you you know dilip is here you know you, some of you should know his story when he just got saved he would bunk office to sit at home and read the bible the whole day <laughs> you know we we were you know we would do the other way right we bunk church to go to office and work more and get more money and when he got saved he would bunk office and i'm like what happened bro are you not well lord no bro i i i i couldn't read bible for two days i'm going to sit at home and i'm just going to read bible an entire day how cool is that that is the kind of hunger that god is looking for and what does the bible say about zacchaeus that he ran and he climbed everybody say ran, ran. and climbed Okay if you are hungry you should you should be constantly running if you are hungry you should have the willingness to climb up to climb up to climb up to where to 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 
to the place of God to climb up the mountain you would see Jesus doing this from time to time he would climb up the mountain you would see the, the, the disciples they would climb up the mountain and you would see that they would remain there to have an encounter with God amen and then the Bible says and Jesus was going to pass that way and when Jesus came by he looked up at Zacchaeus and called him by name Zacchaeus he said quick come down I must be a guest in your home today guess what if you are desperate if you are hungry God will not overlook you that's the good news you know can you imagine there were so many people in the crowd but Jesus eye went to the guy who was on the tree because everybody do what was ordinary Everybody came and you know was part of the crowd, but there was one man who did something extra Do you remember the word from last Sunday? The wise were the ones who did something Extra every the all all ten bridesmaids had oil, but the wise were the ones who had Extra oil amen What did Zacchaeus do that somebody else didn't do? Zacchaeus was not satisfied being part of the crowd that case was like, wait, wait, wait. I'm not here for a crowd encounter. I'm here for a personal encounter. And Zacchaeus did something extra. Somebody say extra. extra. He ran and he climbed. Can you imagine there's a huge crowd and he's running ahead of the crowd and he, and he climbed the tree to have an encounter with Jesus. Amen. Now, if you want to experience the anointing of the Holy Spirit, your hunger level has to be really way up there. And that is why Jesus said in Luke chapter 11 and verse 9, And so I tell you, keep on asking and you will receive. Keep on seeking and you will find. Keep on knocking and the door will be open to you. It is not a one-time thing. It's, it says, keep on doing it. Keep on asking. Keep on seeking. Keep on knocking. Amen? Amen. Verse 10. For everyone who asks, receives. And everyone who seeks, finds. And, and to everyone who knocks, the door will be? It doesn't say 10-person chance. It says, everyone. 100%. Give me verse 11 and 12. It says, you, f you fathers, if your children... Somebody scream fish. How many of you like fish? All Malayalis in the house said an amen. <laughs> of course, Bengalis also like fish. But, you know, uh, in, the Bible says if your children ask for a fish, do you give them a snake instead? If, you're, if they ask for an egg, do you give them a scorpion? Why is Jesus not talking about money here? Why is Jesus not talking about career here? Why is Jesus talking about food? Because Jesus was looking for hungry people. Jesus was looking for people that will be desperate. People that will be hungry for God's presence. Hungry for God's words. Hungry to, to receive something from Him. And that's why it says in the next verse, So if you sinful people know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly father give good gifts to his children? Is that what it says? No. Give. Give. What are we learning about today? The anointing. The path to the anointing. Right? The, the way to the anointing. How do we reach that place where we receive a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit? Can I tell you how? By being hungry for it. By being desperate for it. By, being, by, 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 by asking God for it and saying, God, I, I want a fresh touch of your presence. A fresh touch of your, of, from, from your hand. A fresh touch from, from heaven over my life. Amen? And when we are hungry and when we are desperate, you know, like, like how we would be desperate if you didn't get food for five days. If you didn't get food for 40 days, how, how desperate would you be to eat that KFC burger? How desperate would you be to get, on, get your hands on, you know, whatever is your favorite food? How desperate would you be? That is what God wants you to do when you are after the anointing of the Holy Spirit. God is looking for hungry people. Amen? Amen. 
Can you tell your neighbor, you got to get hungry this morning. Tell your other neighbor, you also have to get hungry this morning. Amen. Amen. That's why the Bible says, those who ask will receive. Those who seek will find. And to those who knock, the door will be opened to them. Amen. Amen. The first thing that you need is hunger. Amen. Amen. The second thing that you need is a good heart. Everybody scream, heart. Heart. Loudly, Heart. heart. The second thing that you need is a heart. And the Bible says in 1 Samuel chapter 10 and verse 9, As Saul turned and started to leave, God gave him a new heart. And all Samuel's signs were fulfilled that day. Who was this man we are talking about? He was the first king of? He was the first king of Israel. He was Saul, amen. And, and who anointed the first king of Israel? Samuel and the Bible says when Samuel when Saul turned and started to leave what happened to him God gave him a new heart, a new heart because a, 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 a new heart and the anointing has to go hand in hand okay now when when God chose the first king of Israel what God did was God first anointed him and then gave him a new heart okay now we all know the story of how that ended right do you know the story do you know the story? What happened? What happened to Saul? He disobeyed God. He rebelled against God. And he lost the purity of heart that he had. Right? And, and then we see that God spoke to Samuel. And God said, go and anoint a, a new person. Give me 1 Samuel 16 verse 6. The Bible says, when they arrived, Samuel took one look at Eliab and thought, surely... This is the Lord's anointed. He's looking, for, he's looking for somebody that God has anointed so he can actually anoint them with oil, right? You remember the all, olive oil? You know, remember the three categories of people who will be anointed? The prophets, the kings, and the priests. These were the three categories of people. And, and Samuel is out to anoint the next king. And Samuel sees Eliab and, and one look at Eliab. You know, you, you know, sometimes when you look at somebody, you're like, wait, this guy looks like a CEO. This guy looks like he should be the pastor of this church. This guy looks like he should be, a, a, you know, there should be at least $1 million in his bank account. You know, this guy looks like, you know, he, he has high connections. And, and Samuel made that mistake. Samuel looked at somebody and said, surely this is the man I'm looking for. And then the Lord said to Samuel, don't judge by his appearance or height. All tall people said, oh no. <laughs> For I have rejected him. The Lord doesn't see the way you see them. The Lord doesn't see things or people the way you see them. What is God looking for? People judge by outward appearance but the Lord is looking at the heart ouch Lord my fair and lovely will not work this morning Lord my cologne will not work this morning my deodorant will not work all of those things are, are wasted this morning is that so Lord because I did a I did a good job while coming to church this morning hoping that I will receive some fresh anointing but God is looking at the beauty of your heart. If your heart is not in the right place, doesn't matter how tall you are, how much muscles you have, how much, how much ministry you have, where all you've been, what all you've done, none of it matters. That is why as a church we've been teaching character. Because, because if you have character and then the anointing comes upon it, you will be able to sustain that anointing. Saul did not have character but the anointing came upon it. He was not able to sustain the anointing. And here was a man, David, who had the character and then the anointing came upon that character. He was able to sustain that anointing. Somebody said an Amen. amen. See, it's not that God doesn't anoint us. It's that God is looking for some people who has childlike heart, who has, uh, uh, you know, purity of faith like babies, you know, who, who are like 
hey, I don't care. I just love the Lord. I don't care who is doing what. I don't care if that guy likes me or not. I don't care if this person is not in the right way. I don't care about anybody else. I know about myself. I know that I love Jesus and I will follow him with all my life. There was this blind man that Jesus healed and, and everybody came and asked him, hey, do you think Jesus really healed you? Do you think, do you think Jesus is the Messiah? Do you think that? Do you think this? And, and he said, guys, 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 I don't know who is what and who is that. I know one thing. I was blind and now I can see. I, I know that I couldn't see once upon a time and this man made me whole. He healed me. That's all that I know. And, and you know, when we keep the purity of our heart like babies, you know what does the Bible say in Matthew 5? Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall go to heaven, for they will get a new car, for they will get a new home or a new land or a new business opportunity. No, for they shall see God. How amazing is that? You know, we're talking about receiving a fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit. I cannot, I can tell you, hey, don't worry, you can, you can just... You know, I'm not asking about your external stuff, you know, what you do on the outside. I'm not, I'm not talking about your works because your works are an overflow of what is in your heart. If your heart is in the right place, if your heart is focused on the right things, if your heart is meditating on the right things, automatically your works will manifest what is in your heart. Because out of the abundance of your heart, your mouth speaks and whatever you speak is what you do and what you become and who you are ultimately right that's the reason your heart needs to be in the right place that's the reason the meditation the bible says lord let the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight your meditation nobody knows everybody knows the song that comes out of your lips but nobody knows the meditation of your heart that is what has to be acceptable in God's sight. Amen. Not just, not just the songs that you sing. 1 Samuel 13 verse 14. Bible says, but now, you know, God is speaking to King Saul and saying, but now your kingdom must end. For the Lord has sought out a man after his own heart. And the Lord has already appointed him to be the leader of his people. How how crazy is this? God is saying, hey, you know what? I am disappointed. I regret making Saul as the king. Now, I have sought out somebody who is already after my heart. You know, I can't, I can't waste my time trying to turn your ways around and trying to, you know, express all of this and trying to get you to follow me. If you see, you know, there are some times when God will go out of his way to pamper you. Okay. But there are some times when God will just let you go. You know, the father, the prodigal son's father, he could have stopped his son from leaving the house. But what did he do? He said, okay, you want to go? Here is your money. Here is your property. Go. Have fun. Because I know that one day you'll be back and your destiny is in this house. Your, your growth will happen in this house. Your, your increase will come by being in your father's hands. You have to, you and I have to come to that place where we are not, we are not seeking just after blessings. We are not just seeking after, you know, the anointing. We can at, at times run after the anointing and forget that our heart is what is more important. We can at times run after, you know, blessings and, you know, all those outside things and forget that if we lose our heart, the Bible says, what profit does it if a man gains the whole world but loses his own soul amen that's why the bible says proverbs 4 verse 23 guard your heart above all else for it determines the course of your life i would have liked it if it would have said guard your ministry above all else or guard your marriage above all else or guard your bank account over above all else or guard your gmail password above all else or you know or or guard your you know whatever it is you know guard that friendship that you have with your pastor above all else because if you lose that friendship you're never going to be able to lead worship in church bro you better guard that relationship <laughs> You know, you, you could have, you know, it could have been anything over there, but God says, guard your heart because that 
determines the course of your life. Because without an anointing from the Holy Spirit, you cannot do anything. Amen. And you will not be qualified for an anointing unless your heart is in the right place. Amen. Amen. So can, can you allow the Lord to do an open heart surgery this morning? Can you just tell him, Lord, I, I know that sometimes I'm, I'm so, so in the wrong. I'm just so, so in the wrong. My heart is desiring for the wrong things. My heart is craving for the wrong things. But I really want you to just come and, and, and help me fix my desires. Help me fix my desires. Help, help me fix my motives. The, why do I want what I want? Why do I want to preach? Why do I want a new job? Why do I want uh, to get married? Why do I want children? Why do I want what I want? Is it for my glory? Is it for my name? Is it for my own kingdom? Or is it for his glory? Or is it for his name? Or is it for his kingdom? That's why the Bible says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Amen? Amen. I've heard people say, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these other things shall be added unto you. you know, there's no focus on the kingdom of God and righteousness. And the focus is on all these other things, you know. All, you know, that is the lure that people, you know, come for. All these other things. Ting, 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 ting. Money is coming, money is coming. Only if I can get some. No, no, no. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all the other things will be added unto you. Amen? Because that's not the focus here. The focus is his kingdom and his righteousness. If we can just be so focused on his, if our hearts can be so focused on him, on his kingdom, on his righteousness, what is the first key to anointing? Scream it out. Hunger. Hunger. What's the second key? Heart. Amen? Amen? So we got to guard our heart. We have to guard what goes into our heart. The third thing, can I share you the third thing? Sure. Scream it with me. Humility. Humility. Scream it loudly. Humility. Humility. You know what the Bible says? That when you humble yourself, when you humble yourself, God will raise you up. God will exalt you. When you try to exalt yourself, God will humble you. It's not bad to desire to, be become, to become great. But it is bad to try to become great on your own. I'll tell you how to how, what to do when you want to become great. Jesus said, he who desires to be the first among you should be the last. Jesus didn't say, he who desires to be the first among you, that's a wrong desire. Leave my company right now. No, Jesus said, it's a good desire. I put that desire in you to become first. I put that desire in you to become great. I put that desire in you to, to, to excel in everything that you do. But that will happen when you have come last. When you're willing to serve. When you're willing to be a slave. When you're willing to be humble. Amen. Numbers chapter 12 and verse 3. Read it with me. Now Moses was very Humble, more humble than any other person. You know why is it in bracket? Why? Because? Sorry? Because it was not said by Moses. Who is writing the book of Numbers? Bible quiz question. Who wrote Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Leviticus, Deuteronomy? Moses wrote the book of Numbers. How cool would it be for Moses to write about himself saying, Now, you know, the man Moses was the most very humble person. These guys they don't, don't know about it, but I am the most humble person on planet earth. No, the reason it is in, in a bracket is because Moses was not the one who wrote this. Somebody else added, probably Joshua or one of the other elders added it there saying, now the man Moses was very humble. For God to look down and say, more humble than any person on earth. Amen. And, and you know what was happening here? Moses' family, his own brother and sister was fighting with him. 
Moses was, by the way, the senior pastor in the house. And you know how senior pastors generally are. They tend to be so dominating. They always want their way and they always are problematic. If anything goes against what they want, they'll, they'll throw a tantrum. I'm not talking about myself. I'm talking about... <laughs> Other, other senior pastors, I'm, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. And, 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 and Aaron and Miriam, they're like, wait, this dude, this, you know, I remember this dude was sitting in a basket when I was running around the house. You know, how dare this guy, you know, he's the youngest in the house. How can he become like the senior pastor over two million people overnight? This is not a good deal. And, and they started fighting Moses. You know what God did? God came to fight for Moses. Do you want to read? Do you want to read the scripture? Give me where it sits. This is what the Bible says. And the Lord said to them, Who is this? Aaron and Miriam. Now listen to what I say. If there were prophets among you, I would reveal myself in visions, and I would speak to them in dreams. Amazing, right? God is saying, if there are prophets, like you know, everybody is like. Moses is a prophet and God is like, hey, wait, wait, wait. Let me redefine prophets to you. If there were prophets among you, this is what I will do. I will, you know, reveal myself in visions and dreams. Amen? Amen? How many of you want visions and dreams? How many of you want increased visions and dreams? Amen. Praise God. But can I give you something better? Are you ready for something better? Give me the next verse. But not with my servant Moses. He is not, he's not just any ordinary prophet. He is my servant. And it says of all the house, he is the one. I. What, what was about Moses that God trusted him so much? It was the fact that he was very humble. The most humble person on the face of the earth. And that's why God says, He is the man I trust. Oh. And God says, Prophets, I will speak to them in dreams and visions. But my son, my servant, I speak to him. How, how do I speak to him? Face to face. Face to face. Clearly and not in riddles. He sees the Lord. Somebody scream it with me. He sees the Lord. As he is. As he is. Why were you not afraid to criticize my servant Moses? You know, all of us would like that, that one person, right? Like, you know, if, if you fight me, I wish that if that guy would come and defend me. You know, that guy, you know, let, let's say that you have a fight with somebody in the church and you come to me saying, Pastor, can you please take my side? You know, can you please go and explain to them that I'm right? In, in, and the pastor comes in quoting a few Bible verses and, and you're like, whoa, that killed it. That, 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 that did the deal right there. How cool would it be if God would come in and God would try fighting for you? And God is like, wait, wait, wait. If you touch Moses, you're touching me. Because he's somebody that I trust. He might have his own weaknesses. He is not ordinary. Why? Because of the reason, because of the way that he is humble. He is somebody that I trust. You want a next level anointing? We have to grow from visions and dreams to face to face. You know, visions and dreams, even Old Testament people had. Come on, I'm not against visions and dreams this morning. I would love for more visions and more dreams and more prophecies. I am given to visions and dreams. So, so I, I don't mind that. But we have to pray for increased level. What is the increased level? We see the Lord. If this is possible in the Old Testament, don't tell me this is not possible in the New Testament. Come on. Somebody said, the glory of the Old Testament is not the greater glory. The glory in the New Testament is the greater glory. If you could do this much in the Old Testament, in the New Testament, you can do that much. Amen? So if, if Moses could have a face-to-face -face relationship with God in the Old Testament, are you telling me that you cannot have that in the New Testament? Are you telling me that you cannot know the Lord as he is in the New Testament? After the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, are you telling me that there is no increased level in the New Testament? Can we desire for this? Can I, can I set you up for this? Can I tell you the qualification to do this? The qualification is that you be very humble. God has to come down and say, wait, 
And now that son, that brother, that sister, he was the most humble person in all of Bangalore Revival Center. Now that small child there, everybody ignores that person, but I know her, his heart. That person is very humble. And because he's humble, he sees the Lord as he is. That is the next level anointing I'm talking about this morning. Amen. We have to stop getting satisfied with what we already have and what we already experience. And we have to start asking God for the next level anointing, for the next portion. Then the book of Isaiah chapter 66 verse 2, the Lord says, My hands have made both heaven and earth. They and everything in them are mine. I, the Lord, have spoken. I will bless those who have humble and contrite hearts who tremble at my word humble and contrite hearts you know what is a contrite heart contrite heart is uh, like a like a like a pressed a crushed a broken heart what does it take for us to 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 have a broken heart to have a heart that is just just humble before God because God is looking God's eyes are looking to bless those kind of hearts God's eyes are looking for those hearts so he can just pronounce his blessing upon them second chronicles chapter 7 verse 14 read it loud and clear with me then if my people who are called by my name will not that God will humble them but we humble ourselves and we pray and then we seek his face and turn from our wicked ways the bible says then i will hear from heaven and i will forgive their sins and i will restore their land what was the difference between david and saul what do you think is a a, a bigger a bigger sin adultery and murder or just you know some sheep stealing he didn't obey the command both of them didn't obey the commandments of God but what, what was the thing that they didn't obey Saul what he didn't obey was he just stole some sheep he was asked to not take those sheep but David it was not just sheep that he stole he stole somebody's wife <laughs> There is in no way comparable to sheep stealing that Saul did. You know, he, he, he not only stole his wife and when he saw that, okay, this is becoming a problem, it's going to become a scandal, he killed the wife's husband. Before killing the wife's husband, he called him back and he, and he tried his best to cover up his mess. When that didn't work, he, he murdered that guy. Now tell me, whose sin is greater? Both of them had sinned, but let's just say, let's just say that I will, you know, I will not be upset with somebody who stole some sheep. I will be more upset with the adulterer and the murderer. Come on, guys. Let's be realistic this morning. Right? But whose sin did God forgive? Why? What was it about David that God was willing to forgive his sin? And God was not willing to forgive Saul's sin. Saul was proud when, when Saul was, when, when, when somebody came to Saul and said, Saul, you've sinned. You know what Saul said? Oh, wait, but this is how it has to be done. This is why I'm doing this. I'm doing this for the Lord. I stole those sheep so I can offer it to the Lord. See, don't spiritualize your reasons. Don't, you know, if, if God says what you did is wrong, just humble yourself. You know what David did? He wrote a psalm. You know the psalm, right? Create in me a clean heart, O oh God. Renew your right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. Uh, you know, Saul was more concerned about the kingdom. You know what David was saying? Lord, I don't care about the kingdom, but don't take your Holy Spirit away from me. I don't care about the blessings, but don't take your presence away from me. I don't care about the wife, but don't take the joy of my salvation. That is what is more important. And he was willing to just go face down. He was willing to humble himself and pray and seek. What does God say? God says, when you do that, I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and I will restore their land. Amen? Amen. 
Not all sins are forgiven, church. Not all sins are forgiven. If, if, you're, if you're still defending, justifying, and, and saying that you were, you were right in what you did, don't ever think that those sins are forgiven. The Bible says if you confess, if you repent, if you turn, if you, if you humble yourselves, then the Lord will forgive your sins. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy that God is saying, if you don't forgive somebody, then God will not forgive you? Some, the, the forgiveness that God had given you, he will take it back when you stop forgiving other people. You know, you know it, it takes a, a humble heart to let go of, of, of the weight that you're carrying. You know, if you can just come to God and say, God, I know that I have not been perfect this week. I know that I have not been perfect, but I'm willing to humble myself in your mighty hands. I'm willing to come to that place of of absolute surrender. I'm willing to forgive my friends. I'm willing to, to, to let go of the, of the weight that I'm carrying on my heart. And I'm willing to let go of this because I, 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 you know, I, I don't mind Marshall getting upset with me. I don't mind Priya getting upset with me. I, 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 don't, I cannot take God being upset with me. I can take all of you guys leaving me, but I cannot take God leaving me. You know, and the Bible says, God loves the humble. He gives grace to the humble, but he fights the proud. If you have a lust problem, he will help you. If you have a money problem, greed, whatever problem, he will help you. But if you have a pride problem, <laughs> he will fight you. All the church put together, you fight me, I will still survive. I promise you that. But God fights me for one day, then I'm buried for life. But because the Bible says God gives grace to the humble, but he, he hates, he fights, he opposes the proud. Amen? So what was the first key that we learned on our path to anointing? Hunger. Amen? Without hunger, you will not get what you're wanting. Right? The second thing is to guard our hearts. Keep your heart in the right place. And what's the third key? Humility. Humility. Amen? Amen? Can I give you the fourth key? This is going to be exciting. I want us to learn this. Honor. Everybody say honor. honor. Inheriting the anointing. There are some things that you don't have to work hard for. You can just inherit it by honoring the person who walks in that anointing. Can I give you a simple example? 2 Kings chapter 2 and verse 9. And when they came to the other side, Elijah said to Elisha, Tell me, what can I do for you before I am taken away? And Elisha replied, Please let me, let me inherit a double portion of your spirit and become your successor. Bro, why don't you go get your own anointing? I had to really work hard to reach where I have reached. You want it overnight? You want to just, you know, like, you know, you just want to, you know, just come and ask me to pray, lay my hands and get it overnight? No, 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 not possible, bro. And, uh, and Elijah replied, you have asked a, a difficult thing. But if you see me when I am taken away from you, then you will get your request. But if not, then you won't. You should understand this story, the backdrop for this. Elijah goes and meets Elisha and he puts his mantle upon Elisha and leaves and walks away. Now, putting the mantle upon Elisha meant that Elijah is anointing Elisha as the next new prophet in town. Okay, Elisha could have stood up and said, wait, everybody, no more going to Elijah. All of you now come to me. I have the mantle. I carry the cloak now. I am the senior prophet in the house. Everybody, Pastor Priji is no more in charge. <laughs> Nobody needs to go to him now. Just, just come to me. But you know, Elisha could have done that. But you know what the Bible says? Elisha ran after Elijah. Uh, you know, Elijah was like, wait, 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 what happened? Why are you following me? And, 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 but he continued following Elijah and everywhere. And you would see that the rest of First Kings, I think it's in word chapter 16, 17, 18. The rest of First Kings, Elisha continued following Elijah. He, was, he remained 
close to Elijah. He continued to honor Elijah. He continued to stay under his covering. He started learning. You know, back then there was school of prophets. In every town there will be 50 prophets. Jericho, 50 prophets. And, and, and this place, across Jordan, 50 prophets. There, 50 prophets. This, 50 prophets. All of these are disciples of Elijah. But there was one man, Elisha, who stayed very close. And the Bible says in, in 2 Kings chapter 2 that all of, this disciple, all of these other disciples came to Elisha and you know, you know how those, they have this poking habit? You know, some people have that, that poking habit. You know, they know you don't want to talk about it, but still they will keep coming and poking, poking you about it and they'll be like, poke, 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 poke. Do you know Elijah is going today? Do you know Elijah is leaving today? Do you know that this is the last day you're getting? You know, you know what Elisha did? Elisha said, Oh, what to do, brother? I, I cannot explain how, how much of a headache this senior pastor is, you know. I, he, he didn't do that. Anybody remember what he did? You go back and read your Bible. He said, shut up. Keep quiet. I know what's happening, but you better keep quiet. When that is a way of showing honor. When somebody talks anything against your mentor, against your father. I'm, I'm teaching spiritual principles here today. I'm not teaching this to you so that I can get anything out of it. I'm teaching you, whoever you respect, whoever you honor, I want you to walk in this. I want you to practice it. When somebody comes and tells you anything bad about them, you don't side with them. What do you say? Shut up. Keep quiet. Stay away from me because I'm not, I'm not going to join your team and I'm not... And, and you'd say that the, the, all the other prophets, they stayed from a distance and they're watching. Oh, now Elijah is going to be taken up. Now Elijah is going to be taken up. But Elisha stayed very close. Elisha is like, it doesn't matter. I, I'm, it doesn't matter. I'm going to stay close to the man of God. I'm going, to stay, I'm going to stay very, very close. Give me the next verse. And the Bible says, And as they were walking along and talking, suddenly a chariot of fire appeared, drawn by horses of fire. It drove between the two men, separating them. And Elijah was carried up by a whirlwind into heaven. Something happened at that moment. Something happened at that moment. Even at that moment, he didn't get the double portion. You would see something happen. Give me verse 12. And suddenly, he said, Elisha saw it and he cried out, my father, my father. You know, all of this time, Elijah was his master. And all of a sudden, Elijah became his father. You know, you don't inherit stuff from your masters. Can I repeat it once again? You don't inherit it just because you worked for some time in somebody's house. You don't inherit their property. But when you are a son, you inherit whatever they carried. Something happened at this point when all this time Elijah was his master. You know, everybody was asking, do you know your master is being taken away today? Do you know Elijah is going off today? It's like, yes, shut up. Don't talk about it. He, was, he still acknowledged Elijah as his master. But all of a sudden at this point, he said, my father, my father. He just, he did not reposition the prophet. He repositioned himself. When he honored Elijah as his father, he repositioned himself as a son to Elijah. And sons inherit what the father carried. Amen. When he began honoring his father, what happened? Automatically, the next word says, the, the cloak that Elijah had left behind. When Elijah was taken away, his cloak was left behind. He carried the same cloak and he started walking. And a double portion anointing of the, of the master was resting upon Elisha. How did this happen? He didn't have to work hard like Elijah did. All that he did was he stayed close to Elijah and he honored Elijah till the end. And, he, and not just till the end, he, he went to the extent of, of giving him the honor of being his father. And when, see, this is, this is a principle I have maintained in the house. I, I know that servants, when you, when you fire them, they leave the church. But sons, when you fire them, they don't leave the church. They're not here for, they're not here for the work. 
They are here for the relationship. There are, there are people in church that have taken off of, some senior leaders in church that have taken off of ministry, taken off of work, and they have still served in the church till date. Why? Because they are sons. They are not servants. Amen? You can, you can never tell a servant to leave. You can, you can tell a servant to leave, but you can never tell a son to leave your house. Why? Because of the relationship that you have with the person. Amen? There is some anointing that, that comes from being hungry. There is some anointing that comes from being humble. There is some anointing that comes from, you know, what was the second thing? Heart, by, by, by having a nice heart. But there is one kind of anointing, the inherited anointing that comes from honor. Everybody scream honor. honor. If you are willing to honor, give me the next verse. This is Matthew chapter 10 verse 41. If you receive a prophet as one who speaks for God, you will be given the same reward as that prophet. Like when you honor a prophet, what do you get? The, the same reward of the prophet. What is the reward of a prophet? A lot of money. He gets to travel all over the world, right? You know, he gets called to all the Pentecostal churches. And, you know, his schedule is packed throughout the year. That's, that's his honor? No. A, a, a prophet's greatest honor is the fact that he hears the voice of God. When, when you honor a prophet, what do you get? The prophet's reward. What is the prophet's reward? To hear the voice of God. And what do you get when you honor the prophet? You begin to hear the voice of God in the same measure, in the same way. Amen. That's why Saul, when he was going to meet Samuel, he said, wait, he's a prophet. You don't go to meet a prophet empty-handed. We have to go to honor him. Because when we honor the man of God, we will be partakers of it we will we will receive from the anointing we will receive from it amen, amen. this weekend we have a prophet, prophet in the house how many of you know that this saturday and sunday i want you to come and honor the prophet why because i'm believing for prophets to arise in our church that so many prophets to arise in our church and that will happen it doesn't matter what he prophesies it doesn't matter if he's even if he's not prophesied over me or over you it doesn't matter we are here to just honor him amen, amen. And when we come to honor him and when we celebrate him, what happens is his reward becomes our reward. reward. We automatically inherit his reward even without actually being anointed in the office of a prophet. Amen. 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 So there is a level of anointing that comes from being hungry. There is a level of anointing that comes from having a good heart and protecting your heart. There is a level of anointing that comes from staying humble and there is a level of anointing that comes by honor amen lord i pray that you will raise honor in this house raise honor for for what you are doing raise honor in this house lord in jesus name you know the last key to experiencing the next level anointing is harmony everybody scream harmony Harmony. loudly There has to be a little harmony in the way we say it, right? So so, so just say it loudly. One, two, three, go. Harmony. Harmony. Amen. Psalm 133, verse 1 onwards. Read it loud and clear with me. How wonderful and pleasant it is when brothers and sisters live together in harmony. For harmony is as precious. Somebody scream precious. As the anointing oil that was poured over Aaron's head that ran down his beard and onto the border of his robe. How many of you remember this from last Sunday? You remember the make of the anointing oil? There were five things in the anointing oil. Cassia, olive oil, cinnamon, calamus, myrrh. Amen. Five things that, were, that the anointing oil was made out of, right? And the Bible says that this harmony, when we dwell together in unity, when we live together in harmony, what is it like? It is like the anointing oil that was poured on. It is not any ordinary olive oil. It is anointing oil. It carries a fragrance. It can consecrate. It can bring you intimacy. It can bring beautification. It can bring all those seven qualities that we learned last Sunday. Amen. And that 
oil that is poured over Aaron's head. That's what happens when we have harmony. Amen? Amen. What happens when we don't have harmony is that we lose that anointing. Is that that anointing begins to leak out. God is still pouring it out, but because there is no vessel, because the vessel is broken, you know, we are his house, right? And the Bible says, don't you know that we are the temple of God and, and the Holy Spirit lives inside of us, not just in our bodies, but we together, our unity. He lives in our unity. And when there is no unity, when there is no bond, and when we are not living in harmony, what happens? There is the anointing oil cannot be contained and it, get, it begins to leak. Verse 3, harmony is not just like, it is not just precious, but it says it is refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon that falls on the mountains of Zion. There the Lord has pronounced his blessing, even life ever. How amazing is that? Anybody in this place who says that fighting, when I constantly fight, I feel refreshed? You know, I have to fight at least once in a day with my wife to feel refreshed. Or I have to feel, fight at least, no, I'm not, that's not a truth, don't take it. <laughs> I'm just giving you an example. Some people are surprised. Oh, does it work? Let me try it. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> it doesn't work. I'm just, I'm just asking you, does, does lack of harmony work? No, but when there is harmony, what happens? It is refreshing, the Bible says. Harmony is as refreshing as the dew from Mount Hermon. First Corinthians chapter 1 and verse 10. I appeal to you, Bangalore Revival Center, I appeal to you by the authority of our Lord Jesus Christ to live in harmony with each other. Let there be no divisions in this church. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Rather be of one mind, united in thought and purpose. Why is it that there is division when we are all of different purpose? When your purpose is to, you know, do that and my purpose is to do this, there will be divisions. But when we are united in one thought and purpose, there can be no divisions. Can I give you one purpose today? Can I give you one purpose today? Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 3 and 4. Make every effort to keep yourselves united in the spirit. Binding yourselves together with peace. Come on. This is the one purpose. Okay. Just read it out with me. For there is one body and one spirit. Just as you have been called to the one glorious hope for the future. And there is one Lord, one faith one baptism and one God and Father of all who is over all and in all and living through all. Come on, go back to the previous slide. It says, for there is one body. Who is that one body? The church. The church is the one body of Jesus. There might be different churches with different names and identities, but how many bodies are there? One body and how many Holy Spirit? One spirit and one glorious hope, one heaven. Okay, there is no different heaven for African brothers and different heaven for Indian brothers. We're all going to the one same heaven. Guys, get used to me. We're all going to be living together in that one glorious hope. Amen. Amen. And then the Bible says there is one Lord. Who is that one Lord? Jesus and then we have one faith which is in the word of God and then we have one baptism all of us there is no separateness of baptism every one of us we are baptized in the same baptism in the name of the father the son and the holy spirit and it goes on to say that there is one God and father of all who is over all in all and now living through all what is it giving us? It's giving us a common purpose. What does 1 Corinthians 1 verse 10 say? Be united with no division, having one mind with same thoughts and one purpose. Sometimes we, you know, we, oh, my purpose, 
It has to be for Bangalore Revival Center. No, wait. That's, you will only be united within this church. If you have to be united with the one body, this has to be your purpose. Your, your purpose is not just about BRC. Your purpose is not just about your community, your tribe, your language. doesn't matter where we are from. The one body, one Jesus, one heaven, one baptism, one Holy Spirit, one Jesus and one Father. Amen? Amen. And one faith that we are all rooted in. That is the one purpose that unites us. That is the one thing that keeps giving us the harmony. And when we, when we walk and live and move in that harmony, what does the Bible say? It is like the anointing oil that was poured out on Aaron. Amen? Amen. All eyes closed. I'm going to pray for that next level anointing over some people today. I'm going to pray. Lord, let that hunger level come into some people right now. Let, let us become desperate. Let us not be satisfied with what we have. And let that, let that hunger level for the next level, let it come and let it overtake our hearts in Jesus' mighty name. Yes, that satisfaction, that lack of appetite for the Holy Spirit, the lack of appetite for Jesus, let it be replaced by their divine hunger. I'm, I'm speaking hunger stimulants into every heart in this place. Hunger stimulants into every heart in this place. Relo say KB na ma say. Suddenly, all of a sudden, all of a sudden, your desire is increasing. Your desire for being in the presence of God is increasing. Your desire for being in the house of God is increasing. Your desire to be in, in, at the feet of Jesus is increasing. You cannot be satisfied with one Sunday morning service. You cannot be satisfied with one prayer. You cannot be satisfied with reading one Bible chapter. You need a face-to-face -face encounter with Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Lord, and I release purity of heart. Come on, just place your hand on your heart and just pray with me. Lord, create in me a clean and a new and a, a beautiful and a loyal heart. A heart that is loyal only to you. A heart that is whose first allegiance is not to my church or my pastor, but to you, Jesus. A heart that is childlike and pure and, 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 and just humble and contrite, Lord. Lord, give me that new heart today. Give me that new heart today. Because I'm, 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 I'm ready. I'm going into my next level. I'm, I'm promoting. I'm getting promoted this morning into my next level. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name. And Lord, I lay down my pride. I lay down my pride. Somebody scream it out. I lay down my pride. Lord, I lay down my stubbornness. I lay down my arrogance. I lay down my rude behavior. Because I'm hungry for this anointing, I lay down everything about myself. I want to be like Moses, who was most humble, more humble than anyone else on earth. I want to lay down, I want to lay down, I want to just surrender before you, daddy. I want to just surrender, I want to just lay down before you, master. And Lord, I pray for honor over this place. Honor. Honor for anointing and honor for the anointed people. Lord, I pray that there will be an increased level of honor. That, that, we, that, that some people that are called, that are supposed to be prophets over our life, we will not just, just call them our friends and we will give them authority as prophets over our lives. Some people that are supposed to be fathers over our lives, we will not just call them pastors and masters, we will give them the honor of father so that we can receive from them, so we can receive the inheritance and we can, we can work in the double portion anointing. And, and Lord, right now I pray for a harmony. Come on, just hold the person on your left and your right. Right now we are praying for harmony. We are praying for harmony. We are praying that God, you unite us together as one body. You unite us together as one church. Under that one Jesus. Under that one Father. Under that one Lord. In that same one baptism. In the same one spirit. Lord, unite us together. Bind us together, Lord. Everything that is dividing us. Every sin that is dividing us. Every pain, every confusion that is dividing us. I come against it in the mighty name of Jesus. 
Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, rule in this house. You are the one Holy Spirit over all of us. So we pray that you will rule over this house right now. Lord, let harmony be restored and released. Let it come back into this house this morning in the mighty name of Jesus. Everything that is breaking the harmony, everything that is breaking the harmony, every problems and relationships, this morning I, I, I declare a warning and I declare an arrest warrant against you. In the mighty name of Jesus, leave Bangalore Revival Center. Leave the church of God in Bangalore. Leave the house of God right now in Jesus' name.